link for today's session on XArray, which is a very powerful library for, for Python that we're using all the time. Um, I hope most of you will have seen the videos that we've posted around. These will be more of a uh, question and answer session. Um, just a quick reminder that for, to everyone, if um, Aiden will be about to um, share the screen occasionally. And when you do, there is an, there's an option. up here, yeah, up here, view options um, that you can tick and say uh, fit to screen. That makes it much easier for you to see everything that, that's going on. Um, and with these words, uh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll be monitoring the chat as well. So if you have questions and you don't want to interrupt what Aiden is saying at the moment, you might type them in the chat and then either I will uh, and can answer them or I can pass them on to Aiden and with this, I'd like to hand over to Aiden. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks very much, Holger. Um, so this this was a sort of a, a flipped uh, version of the training. Um, I hope. So the original email that went out uh, pointed you at a, a GitHub, so a series of training videos on the GitHub site. The GitHub site had the all the um, notebooks from the training videos as well as two worked examples. Uh, did anyone have a chance to go through those worked examples, those exa those exercises, and try it for themselves? Cool. So this tutorial will take the, the form of just running through those worked examples. But please feel free to ask questions at any time, and then we can ask uh, you can ask more questions at the end if you have any other queries and general queries about X-ray. We'll start with the first of those problems. Depending on how quickly we go through, uh, we could end up doing a second one as well in this time, or we can do it next week. Uh, so it's just really up, up to you guys how much you want to ask and how quickly we want to go through this. So um, I'll just start sharing my screen. What you're going to see um, is uh, a Jupyter notebook. Uh, session. Can you see that now? Um, yeah, thumbs up, cool. Uh, I'm using a rather large uh, monitor, so is that an okay size and shape? I can make it a little bit bigger. It's People fine want. for me. Maybe just one more, one, there we go. Okay, so there was a series of uh, videos just explaining um, how to use X-Array. Some of them you may have known already, and some of them may be new, but it was just a sort of an overview of some of the more powerful aspects of X-Array. So this is this first work example. So these were just problems, random things that I, I thought up to try and exercise some of these, uh, some of these X-Array uh, methods for analyzing data, but I'm happy to, um, uh, if there was if there's any feedback about what what would be constitute good examples, I'm always happy to change them. Um, so if as long as everyone's understands how Jupyter Notebook works, um, all I'm doing when I'm so these cells I've already filled in, just but um, I'm just um, pushing uh, Shift Enter to to execute those cells. So the first first part of the the work example asked you to open the monthly surface temperature data set from a CMIT five model and select out the TAS the surface temperature at surface variable um, and and do some spatial slicing on that. So you can see in this next cell that's what I'm using. I've just specified a URL. XRA can open up can use. Uh, open data from DAP URLs. So that's just an easy way so that everyone can access the same data, site, data set. Equally, that could be a file path. Uh, so in this, this uh, example, I'm just using X-Array, the open data set call, the URL, selecting out the variable TAS. X-Array does a number of useful things, and one of which is to create a, a, an attribute for all of the variables. So you can you can either... Uh, specify uh, specify them using a dictionary type um, call with uh, with square brackets and and the and the name in, in the square brackets, or you can use them as an attribute like this. 
So that's just the one variable. And I'm selecting out um, the slice that corresponds to hopefully Australia. Um, and then if I just print that out, so all I've done is put the, the XRA variable name uh, as, as the sole thing in the cell, and that's going to print out my um, uh, uh, sort of representation of the data. I'm using an older version of XRA, it looks like actually, because I'm, I'm using this on my local computer. So some of the newer ones have much, much nicer sort of interesting looking um, uh, representation in, in HTML. Anyway, that just depends on the on the the one you're using. So in this case, I'm just going to plot. Um, just check that my slicing is correct by plotting the first time step. So here, see, I've got my variable that I that I loaded up here, Taz underscore Oz, um, and then I'm just selecting out the first time step because, as you see here, it's got 1,872 time steps and the latitude and longitude. So if I try and plot just Taz, it will do, it'll aggregate it and turn it into a bar chart, a histogram. So if I just select out the first time slice of the iCell, so this is, iCell is selects on um, index and cell selects on values in the coordinate. So I just wanted the first one, so I just can use zero. And then I'm just plotting it. This plot call here is, is very useful. It's wrapping matplotlib, but it does lots of useful things for you like uh, populate your latitude and longitude, um, your your axes. It, it, anyway, the title it does it, it's it's really quite easy and e uh, simple to use. But you can pass it some other arguments. So just make it a bit bigger, for example. So that was just to just to confirm that I'd done my slicing correctly. So the visual conf confirmation that pretty much that looks like Australia to me. So the next step in the problem was to create a month of climatology for the 1950 to 1980 period. So this is a compound, it's called chaining, a compound uh, command. So I'm taking my, my variable that I've sliced before out of the main data set, just the TAS, the surface area over Australia. Now I'm using a cell, not an I cell, but a select um, command. And I'm giving it actual values that appear in the time coordinate. So these are just strings, but they're, it's a very useful way to, to specify things like dates. And you can just give it years, 1950 to 1979 would work. But in this case, I'm just making sure that I'm getting the first month to the 12th month. I'm grouping those by time. So uh, X-Ray has a bunch of useful uh, features. Group by is one of them. Where it, so what they're effectively going to do is, is look at the time dimension, find a month in each one, group them all together so that e in each of these sort of sub data sets will just be each month for that whole time series um, uh, for the time for the sp spatial area. And then I'm going to do a mean in the time dimension. So if I, I can, I can plot all those uh, climatologies I've just made. Uh, and again, this is the power of X-Array, just with the plot, again, just with plot, but this time I'm, I give it a, uh, an argument, col. Yeah. Do you think it will be useful to show task or claim, uh, what it looks like, that it has a month uh, dimension and stuff like that before? I could do. Um, mm -hmm. So um, what Claire was saying was that if you just put Tazos Clim into the cell and, and uh, execute it, then it shows you what the, the structure of the data. And in this case, it's replaced the time dimension with a month, but the latitude and longitude are, have remained the same. So that's what the group by has, and, and just appending the mean, the operator to the end, applies the mean to each of those months, each of the lat long, uh, each of the spatial areas um, for each month in, in all in the whole 30 years of the time of the data set uh, and then it creates a new new dimension called month so and she's quite right so that's what I've used here in the plot I've said please make my column the month which is my new dimension and what it 
does is make what's called a facet plot. So each month is um, the column is um, I've said coal wrap at three, so it just means that it's going to do a three by four uh, plot. But you see, um, just with one simple command, it's done quite a complex plotting operation. And it's, this is the climatologies, the spatial climatologies for each month uh, over the 30 year period that we've selected. So that was a pretty, uh, a relatively complex operation if you wanted to do all that uh, manually, uh, but x -ray makes it uh, pretty simple. So the next step was is to create, uh, to calculate the anomalies. So here, I'm, I'm assigning it to a new variable, Taz underscore Oz underscore anom, anom but I'm, so I'm taking my previous uh, group by operation, which it, which it did up here. So I haven't saved this to any, uh, I, I did say that. So when I'm using the climat uh, climatology. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm doing the same operation I was before. So um, I'm taking all of the data, I'm grouping by month, then I'm taking away the climatology. And so what that's going to do is temporarily make those the same, the same uh, groupings by month, take away the climatology, but then it's, you're going to be, you're going to remain, you're still going to have all of the, um, the, the spatial dimensions that you had before um, and all of the time dimension you had before. So it just does a sort of temporary grouping um, in order to do the operation, but then um, you still still remains with a full time series. So. Hey, Aidan, sorry, I've got a quick question. Yep. Um, were there different versions of this notebook on GitHub? Because the one I have says to select from the period January 1990. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But. Oh, does it? You're right, actually it says 1990, 2005. Yeah, sorry, so I should have pointed this out. What I'm doing, at the moment is going through a notebook that is on here, um, but is there's another branch called answers. Uh, oh. If you go to the answers branch, it's got, it's got these here. Now I may have made an update. It was, a, it's a, it's a bit time consuming to keep them up to date. So I may have made an update and then not propagated it properly to my other branch. So if I have on, I apologize. Um, it's, that's not good. So 1990 to two. 2005. So what did the other one say? We can just change it. Yeah, it just says from 1990 and I think the data ends in 2005. So. Okay. So I, I think it, I think the dates for the climatology were, were right. Oh, were they? So yeah, it was just the anomalies. Just the anomalies. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, we'll do that down here. Right. Yeah. So, okay. uh, so we've created all the anomalies for the whole data. So you don't have to do it that way, but that's what we've done. Um, but then down here, we said, so the, the problem is to say, well, can you plot them from 1990 to the end of 2005? So uh, we've got our TAS uh, Oz anomaly uh, variable here. So we just can just do a select. Um, the reason, part of the reason for doing this is just to show you that selects uh, slice, these are slice operations. The slice doesn't have to have uh, an upper bound. And then in that case, it'll just use however much data you've got. So in this case, 2005. So, um, so we'll do the anomaly, we'll group by month, we'll do a mean in the time, and then we'll, and we'll plot it. <laughs> there you go, so you can, you can chain together a, a lot of operations. So once again, we've got the anomalies. Now we're just taking the 1990 to the, to the end of the data set, which is 2005, we're grouping by month, taking a mean. So this is the mean anomalies from 1990 to 2005, and then we're plotting them by month in a facet plot. So um, that's that's quite a complex operation. Uh, as I say, if you wanted to do that without without X-ray, it, it'd be sort of fiddly. So some of these things, it's very expressive and very easy to do. So here we, I mean, sorry. Um, so here, so these are the anomalies. So effectively, we're looking at some sort of uh, climate change signal, I guess. And um, you can see that it's uh, particularly strong in February, um, maybe a little, little less so in uh, March, April, and some pretty strong signal in, in um, June and August. Yeah. 
So anyway, um, uh, it just as I shows the power of the of uh, X-ray, we can do the same thing, but with seasons. So before, when we did a group by, it said time dot month. Now these are sort of special uh, sort of aggregation functions that um, that X-ray exposes. So you can have time of the you can have day of the month, uh, month and season are, the, are some of the ones that are are there automatically. So in this case, we're doing a seasonal. This is the same anomalies, same time period, 1990 to the end of the data set. Whoops. We're grouping by um, by season, DJF, JJA. We're uh, doing a mean over time. So it's for the anomalies for that whole time period. And then in this case, we're plotting the column is season because in the same way that a group by operation, when you did time by dot month, made a new month axis. Time.season makes a new season axis. And, and there you go, there we've got our, our uh, climate change signal in this uh, surface temperature record from the CMIP5 model for um, 1990-2005 based on a um, 1950 to 1979, 1980 climatology, which is a sort of standardish thing to do, I think. You can, here's an example, to take this sort of to an, a next level uh, you, in order to just to say, just to use, see the land data, you can use the land fraction, which is in this data set. So here I'm op opening um, the appropriate um, file from the CMIP data. It has land fraction uh, as a, as a um, variable, it, SFTLF, to what we can just, uh, escape. We can just put that out and see what, what the hell that means. Land area fraction, here we go. Um, and you can see I did that straight from the open data set URL, just put the dot SFTLF. I had to know what that was, but so now we've got a land fraction. So now we can use masking. So this is a masking operation. So you see the masking in there. Um, so we're going to do the same plot we did above. So um, this is the monthly one, but we're going to say only going to do it where the land fraction is greater than zero. And we do all the other operations. We group by time, we do a mean, and we do the plot. And then we can get uh, a, a nice plot of, of um, the surface temperature anomalies, average of the surface temperature anomalies from the climatology over land. You can see there are some pixels up here with Papua New Guinea and um, Timor and whatnot. Um, with more work, you could get rid of those. Uh, but as a, as a simple first pass, that's, it's not bad. So I've gotten through that quite quickly, as it turns out. Um, so do we have any particular questions? Did people have any problems with that, with that problem set? Um, did you do it a different way? And you, you want to ask if that was better or worse or any questions at all um. I have a quick question but maybe you'll go through it later yep Is there like something really simply you could do just to like add coastlines to that or add sorry what like coastlines our oh, coastlines yeah um you can you have to use well you, you should use something called uh carter pie oh yeah okay That's um, what I, was I just didn't know if that was like a simple like you could just do yeah coastlines and it would come up or something. yeah um because effectively this is just sort of gridded data um you need so then you need to put some sort of um, coastlines is usually sort of vector data. Yeah. And so to overlay that, you really need something like Carter Pi, which will sort of project data onto, onto an underlying um, map or grid. Whereas all this is doing is just sort of plonking pixels uh, in, a, in a square box. So it's, it's not terribly smart. 
Um, but it, yeah, so Cartify is something you could do. We can have a look. I could pull up uh, an example from somewhere else and show you how how to do that. But it sounds like you've done that already. Is that right? Yeah, I've been. Yeah, I've been doing Cartify. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks. That's okay. Well, if we have some time at the end, I can pull up another different plot from some uh, uh, notebook from the Cosima cookbook, which goes through that pretty extensively. Um, anyway, so if we don't have any, if no one has any particular questions about this one, I can go into the next um, problem that was on the web, on the training. So this one uh, was just an example on how to calculate the El Nino 3, 4 time series. Um, as again, just a sort of something I thought might be of interest for people. So um, I don't know if people know, have done that sort of thing before already, but uh, the Nino, El Nino 3, 4 index is, is, a, is a box um, in the equatorial Pacific. Uh, that is used to create this this time series. So we'll do that with X array. Um, just do our imports. Everyone knows that about the matplotlib inline, right? That just makes sure that all your plots show up inside your Jupyter notebook. We'll use uh, that Syro CMIP5 data set again. In this case, we'll load the whole data set. And if you just execute that with, a, with just the data set, the variable name in there, you can see that it's um, it's 360 by 300, 1872 time steps. And the variables it has are temperature of surface. I think that's the surface of the ocean, isn't it? And, um, and that's about it in this case. Hey, Aiden, I've got a quick question. Sorry. Yep. I've never really understood what the time bounds variable is. So uh, time bounds is, uh, it's usually got just two values. It's the same size as, as time, but it's got this bounds thing as well. And it's just the beginning and the end of, of each of the time uh, points. So usually they're like months. And so it's the beginning of the month and the end of the month. Um, right. Okay. So it's, it, you, you may think you don't need it, but if your time bound, if, if it was uh, sort of three daily or something, then it might make more sense or 12 hourly, it makes even more sense to specify mm -hmm. what those bounds are. So that's why they're there. Okay. They don't tend to get used a lot, but they get carried along with things. Um, but as I say, in some cases, you'd, you'd want to make quite sure that you were using them. But in this case, uh, it doesn't really make much difference just for monthly data. So you see, this is a CMIP data set. So it has lots of um, metadata in, involved and in, uh, associated with it, which you can use. Uh, clearly to find out more about how the data was created and curated. So uh, in this case, we wanted to find the sea surface temperature um, after 1950. So um, we just make a new variable called TOS just because it's easier mostly um, and slice it. So we're doing this time slice in 1950. Here you see, we're just using the, the year. That's all you need in this case. And if we plot that, it's always just a good idea to um, to plot. So I just again use the I cell. So in this case, just an index, not a not a string specifying a date. Just to just to eyeball the data. It's always a good idea. You find out things like it's in Kelvin, which you could have seen from up here, I guess, but it makes it a bit more obvious. That can be something to really look look out for. Uh, a lot of the CMIP data is in Kelvin, and a lot of the um, straight model output data tends to be in Celsius. So uh, as if you did this before, you would have said, seen the, that um, this data is on a tripolar grid. It has this weird thing where it has these poles over the ocean, over the land so that there's not one over the ocean. It's actually wrong here at 65 north. But anyway, anything from north of 65 latitude, 65 north, is in this tripo tripolar area. And that's, so that's why when you see here, and you look in the data itself, um, the coordinates, it just has I and J, which you can see are just integers go from zero to, you know, the size of the dimension minus one. And the latitude and longitude um, are 
two dimensional. So that's and that's that's because this is um, called a curvy linear grid. So the the latitude and longitude are a function of let of of uh, i and j because of this crazy grid up here. If you didn't have that, then it it would be you wouldn't need um, uh, you wouldn't need to do that. But it makes it more complicated when you're selecting spatial regions out of a grid like this. Now, some grids, so the MOM ocean grids, for example, tend to have two sets of coordinates. So they'll, they'll have a lat and a long, and then something they call like geo lat and geo long. And so the latitude and longitude are what you'd call a sort of uh, an effective two, 1D grid. They're, they're wrong <laughs> up to here, but they make it easy to use for every area that isn't in the tripole. Uh, but unfortunately, this I think this must come from size. It doesn't have that grid. You can add it, but anyway, it doesn't have it at the moment. So there's no easy way to use latitude and longitude uh, selection with this data as it stands, just using slice. So slice is really nice because you can go slap, slice, you know, blah, blah. That's what we did before. Just give it some latitude and longitude bounds. You can't do it with this data as it, as it stands. Um, so yeah, so there are a few ways I said of selecting it. You can find the cell indices for the region of interest and just use, use uh, actually it should be I cell. Anyway, so that's one way of doing it. Um, you can just chop off, chop off the tripole part of the grid and add new 1D latitude and longitude coordinates because we're looking for El Nino. It's just around the equator. We don't really care about the tripole. That's another option. Uh, you can, or you can use where and select out all the values within the bounds of interest. So this is what we'll do. Um, it just, it's not as neat, but it's very easy for this in this case. So what we're doing here is to say, well, we're using this where statement and we're giving it a bunch of, uh, we're giving it four separate logical, uh, array, uh, statements arrays so each one of these will will create a an, a an array that's the full size of the dimensions with true or false in it and so the first one will say well we just want everything that's above five degrees so that'll create one array everything that's that's so less than five degrees everything that's greater than minus five and that'll create another true and false and when you add those together you'll get a strip around around the globe but then if you add a um, another one, which another condition, which is all of them greater than 190, then it'll stop at 190. And then the fourth one, give it a condition that's less than 240. And now you've got, when you and all those together, that you'll have a box that's be that's between those bounds that you need. So we do that. And so the other the other important thing to notice is I've put I've put drop equals true here. So what that's doing that what that will do is drop all of the coordinate values that don't have anything, any true, any true values in them, any, in, the, the, in the mask. And that, that means that we will uh, get back a data set with only the, with only the, the box that we're interested in, which means that it'll be faster com to compute and plot more easily. Now that should have finished already quite sure just wait a sec okay that's done so so now you see we've our, our temperature at sur of the surface of our Nino, Nino 3 4 box is the time series which we'd already decided was 1950 so 672 time steps but our box is now only 30 by 50 in extent so it looks like it's worked. You can here we're just in this box. I'm just you can see I've just done some print statements. Check we have the correct spatial extent. So here I've looked at I've just taken the, the latitude um, coordinate, which I can refer to as an uh, um, just with an attribute. Taken the minimum value of that, and then I've accessed that um, that internally is stored as a num numpy or numpy array. And um, in order just to get to pull that out from not being sort of wrapped by a um, by an X-ray object, I've just said dot values. So that just re just returns the the numbers in there. 
and it turns out that's just going to be one number and the same thing here for the maximum extent so here i've just calculated the latitude and longitude range and that looks like what i want so i'm happy with that um i've also this is just a bit of overkill but i personally always really like to see things plotted out it just makes me feel happier that i've done it right so this is an example of using of overlaying two plots so what i'm going to do here is just plot the temperature of the surface just that first time slice and i'm going to i'm going to give it an alpha value of 0.1 which means it'll be faded out and i'm going to i'm going to save th that into a variable what that does is means that i can then access uh attributes of that variable and in, in, specifically the axes attribute so that then i can do another plot that will plot over the top of it using the same axes and that other plot i'm going to do is the same same operation i did before the where operation to select that that area but i'm not going to do drop equals true because i want to plot it on the same on the same uh, uh, plot and and hopefully that will what that will do is plot a little box that I've selected over the top. It's just the first time slice again, uh, but it won't have an alpha applied to it, so it'll it'll be a little stand out. So, like I said, it, it's it's not important. You don't need to do this, uh, but it just shows you the sort of things you can do to sort of make plots or satisfy yourself that you've done the right thing. Because um, if you just plot out the Nino three four, you can see latitude and longitude, but uh, it has no other uh, information to tell you whether it's you think it looks like it's in the right place. And the other thing it doesn't have is if you just if you if you plotted it without uh, dropping the axes, but you didn't put the other plot underneath, it's just a big white box with a little thing in there. So it doesn't. So anyway, there you go. So we've got the original data behind there, and we've just plotted out Nino three four box over the top. Like I said just to satisfy myself that it's in the right place. Looks okay. So we want to calculate a monthly climatology of the mean sea surface temperature for 1950 to 1979. Now, I wonder if this will work. And I'm just going to go, so I'll just print that out. So this is very similar to what we were doing before. Yeah. So We've taken a time slice from 1950 to 1979. We've grouped by month and we've done a mean uh, over IJ and the time. So all that should be left now is a data array with, with 12 values. So that is the mean surface temperature in the El Nino 3 4 box over the 1950 to 1979 period for each month. So, um, in this case, we're comparing it to the classic Trinberth paper, as I said. So, I, I, so what I've done here is um, plotted that climatology we just just um, just computed, but I'm taking away the um, offset for Kelvin because the Trinberth stuff was in degrees. I put that in in brackets. When you do that that's going to return um, an X-ray data set, a sort of temporary one. And so then you can use stuff like dot plot on this temporary thing. It, it sort of exists while the plot is being calculated and then goes away again. So I'm just plotting that, giving it a label. And then I'm just making, just creating this, the trend birth data set just by making a data array um, called mean underscore SST. It's very simple, just a bunch of temperatures and, and Celsius and just a simple coordinate, which is just um, one to 12, which is the number of months. And then I'm plotting that uh, over the top of the previous one. Uh, why didn't I need to use axes? Anyway, it didn't, it, it just, it overlaid it um, automatically. And then I plotted a legend um, because you see this one had a label as well, trend birth. So that was just to, to compare, it's not, it's not correct. Um, it's not disastrous, I guess. I don't know. I don't have any opinion really, except that I, it's possible to do it. But if now we can cal cal calculate the Nino 3 4 index by subtracting the monthly climatology from the original sea surface temperature data. 
and take the mean over the spatial coordinates. So this is very similar to what we did before, um, but just in this, in this one little box. So we're grouping all of the data by the month, but again, we're not, not doing anything to it. So all that's gonna do is make a bunch of temporary data sets for each month, do the, do the subtraction of the climatology, and then return uh, the full time series again. And then I'm doing a mean, uh, a spatial mean. So now um, this Nino 3.4 uh, should be a, it's a spatial mean over that box uh, for the time period, for, for the entire time series from 1950, for a climatology from 1950 to 1980, um, and it's plotted as a time series, which is pretty cool, um, pretty easy to do. Um, now the trend birth methodology said we need a five month moving, moving average. So um, XRA has a method called rolling, which will do a, a rolling window. So um, we've had the data before, where we saved the data in the next three, four, so we can, yeah, so we've saved it, we've plotted it. So with the same data, we'll just do a rolling time series and we'll do a mean of that window. So you have to, you're doing an operation on a, on this on these windows. The rolling op thing will do s something very similar to the uh, group by. We'll produce a, a series of um, data sets with uh, a time window of five, and then we apply the mean to it. And there you go. There's the smooth data. Um, and then the last step is to normalize by the standard deviation. So we'll just um, we've got our uh, data here. We'll select our time slice for the standard deviation over the climatology period. We'll, we'll save that into a variable called climatology underscore standard. You can see that's just a single value. And then um, you could save the result of your rolling time mean divided by your standard deviation in a, in, a, in a new variable, or as I say, you can put the, the parentheses around it. So it's now a temporary data set and just plot it. Um, and so that's, that's divided by the standard deviation. And then um, we can add some um, of those, uh, some dashed lines at the minus 0.4 and plus 0.4 which is the El Nino threshold, according to the paper. So that's, that's pretty much what was required in the problem set. Um, but we can go further and we could sort of try and recreate this uh, sort of classic figure. So we'll um, create a temporary data set, which is the, the El, Nino, El Nino index divided by the climatology. So that, and then, um, with some with some fancy uh, plotting um, ish, we can pretty much reproduce that. No, it's not the reproduce. It's not the same figure. Obviously, it's different data, but <clears throat> reproduce the same looking figure. Um, and that's by using some matplotlib um, extensions. So in this case, um, with matplotlib, you have to do stuff. So this is instead of using just the dot plot. Um, you know, we're setting up a figure. And we're doing a bunch of matplotlib calls. This is fill between, so we're filling it, filling some values, but these values here with, you know, with black. Uh, and then, um, and then we're doing our, we're, we're actually using the, the XRA plot um, to, pl to plot the data um, in black. I can't remember, it's ages since I did this. Anyway, um, and it's a bunch of, um, and putting some lines on there for to make it look nice, like at zero and minus 0.4 and plus 0.4. But anyway, and then giving it a nice title with even with proper units and everything. So that's just an example of um, the sort of power of things you can do. Sometimes finding out exactly how to do all these things can be a real pain in the bum. Um, but um, uh, in that case, it wasn't too bad as long as you knew the right way to do it. So in, in this case, there's even used an, an alpha channel on those plots as well to get their faded gray in there. Um, and the other thing, the trend birth paper had some 
actual percentages of the number of months that were El Nino and La Nina. So again, you can use, you can um, figure those out from um, just doing something like this. You can do a mask, you're masking the, the variable with a where with this condition of greater than or equal to 0 0.4 and then doing a count, which just counts the number of true values and then just dividing it by the total number of values. Um, for example, so 21% and 16%, which is pretty low, I guess. Um, oops, so it's not managing to to capture a, the right number of El Nino and La Nina events anyway. Um, and just as one last thing, um, last time I did this, someone asked, how do you select an area that is outside of a box? So before we were saying, oh, how do you make you get the area inside the box? Well, you do that, for example, um, in this case, we're selecting all the area that isn't in the El Nino by using an or. Before we used and, we anded our logical masks together. Here we're using an or, and we're specifying all the areas that are uh, to the north, south, east, west, and east of our bo boxes, east and west um, of our box. And um, if you do, if you do that, then you can you see you can mask out the El Nino three form. And equally, uh, you can do the same thing, but. Um, if you wanted to fill that with some other data, which is someone had, they said, oh, what if I want to replace a box? Well, in this case, I've done exactly the same thing, but, but I've given it the optional argument, which is to, so by default, it'll just put NAN in there, but it, we can give it an, we can give it a, just a value. Um, so if you give it a value of zero, which is a bad idea because it's in Kelvin. <laughs> so zero Kelvin, not good. Um, but um, but you can see you can just replace it with a value or you can give it another data set that's, that's the same shape. In this case, it's just the data from um, July that's now put into that box. So everywhere where, where the mask uh, is, is true, um, it's this data and it's not, it's this other data that's it's bought from here. That's got from this, from the other, and, uh, because this the outside data is from January and this is from July. So that so was just Aiden, just mm -hmm. about that um replacing that data. Mm -hmm. So I would have thought that um that would have tried to replace the data that's not in that sort of Nino box with the data. Yeah, so that's what it has done. So did I I may have misspoke. Yeah, so here it's 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 filled it with NANs. And mm -hmm. here it's filled up with the data from uh, July. Yeah, but sorry, I would have thought that it should have filled everything outside the box with the data from July. Am I interpreting that wrong? Um, yeah, that's that's not right. Um, okay. So the, where the mask is true, it's... Um, it, it, so, for example, when we did the box, which was the simpler case, mm -hmm. we, were, we were masking and saying everywhere that's greater than five, less than five latitude, mm -hmm. Great, you know, so it's everywhere within here. So that mask says, this is what I want to keep. Okay. Yeah. Um, so down here, we're actually, we've flipped around the sign of those things. So we're, so we're saying everything that's above five, below five, and outside the box. Um, we want to keep that. We want to keep that. Right. And that's okay. what we've kept here. Yeah, it can be a bit confusing. That's why I find uh, plotting it's really useful uh, because then you can go, have I got the right, you know, have I done what I th thought I did? And even doing it in steps like this where you just just get rid of, don't do anything. Okay, now I've got a box. Okay, now I'm going to put some data in there and I can see that I've replaced it with what, with what I think I have, for example. So I, this was just a random question, but it was just that someone asked it last time. So I thought um, it's probably worth going over that again. So does anyone have any questions about that? Any, do they have any problems with, with this uh, problem? I have an unrelated question, if, but it's, <laughs> sure. it's related to X-ray sort of. So yep. how can you change the number of, um, if you're trying to look at a value at a specific location, how can you change how many decimal points the notebook is outputting? 
or will it just always default to exactly the number of decimal, decimal points in the value? It will just default to how much this, the, what's in, contained in the data. Um, so what do you need to do with it? So um, I've been trying to create some five-day averages of data using the NCO operators, and I'm just comparing it to five-day averages created from X-ray to check that it's right. And it seems that the NCO method has like dropped off the last two decimal points of all the values. Um, and I'm not sure if it actually has or if it's just the way that the notebook is viewing the, the, the values. Right, so uh, when you're using it's NCO, mm. um, you're saving it back out to a NetCDF file again? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one thing you could do is just uh, dump the NetCDF file. You know how to do the dump it, NC dump? I think so. Yeah, so NC dump minus V, the variable name, and then mm -hmm. the file name. Pipe that into less or something because it'll just go and, okay. and it'll turn. I mean, if it's multi gigabytes, it'll turn it all into text and take forever. Yeah. So pipe that into less. And then you can just you can just see the actual values that are stored inside the file, uh, for, for example. So you could just look at like the first few values. That's, okay. that's one option. Um, the other option is um, uh, Num NumPy has some, um, NumPy has some uh, fuzzy matching options. Yeah. So you could, um, I, can't remember, I can't quite recall what they're, what they're called now. Um, um, is it within? Um, so you can do some tolerances. Um, uh, so you can do some comparisons within tolerance. Is is close? There you go. Numpy dot i s c l o s e. So um, you've always got that slight problem with X array that um, that uh, it doesn't support all of the operators off the bat, um, but you can always, um, oh, there you go. So X-rays, X-ray testing has got an all close, I wonder what, yeah. So in the X-ray testing um, something, it's got an, it doesn't assert, but um, should be able to use so it's got a tolerance. So assert underscore all close, and it's got a tolerance that all of them have to be within, for example. Okay. The other option you can do is to take one away from the other and look at what the difference is and make sure that it's not larger than a certain value. Mm -hmm. That's what I would generally do, probably. Um, and, um, and, you know, you can plot that difference to see if there's any spatial uh, patterning to it or whatever. Um, yeah. But yeah, so there's, there's a bunch of options you have. Okay, thanks. No problem. Um, I'll just uh, go, I'll just grab the, um, I'll just go back to that previous thing about plotting. So, I'll just share this just a moment. So this, what I'm about to show you um, is from the Cosima cookbook. No, that's not it. Um, so Cosima, uh, so Consortium of CI Modeling Australia. Um, so a bunch of people from CLEX are in the Cosima thing as well. And uh, it's just, it's not important. It just um, it's just that it has a has some ways of finding Cosima data, so you don't really have to know about that. All you need to know really is that um, it's loading a variable. It's using X array behind the scenes to grab the data using a database. Um, so this is at Cosima recipes, uh, and it's called 
it's in the documented examples um, page. Um, no, that's not the right one. It's not it. Where am I? Load nice plot. Spatial selection. This is, it. This is uh, just one I did the other day. People wanted to know. So this is an example that's very similar to the data we saw before. It's mom with a mom motion with a size ice grid. Um, in this case, it's higher resolution and slightly different versions of those models because it's sort of been updated. So it's 2,700 by 3,600. But nonetheless, it's, you know, it's very similar. Um, and what I was trying to get at in this case, it was very, it's very similar because it only has this um, coordinates, just, it just has the 2D ones or just I's and J's. So when you plot it, you don't get any useful information on the uh, X and Y axis. And so in this case, this is an example of where I've added some spatial coordinates, some one dimensional ones, those sort of ones that aren't quite right, but they're good enough for a lot of work. I've just added them uh, using an assigned coordinates call and it doesn't really matter, but um, so that you can plot the data and get longitude and latitude on the axes. But then also that means that you can use this uh, cell using a slice, so slice uh, longitude and latitude, which is nice and, and works really nicely on the um, Southern Ocean. But, uh, and, and so this is an example of using um, Carter Pi, which is what someone was asking about before. So we create a figure, um, we get some axes, we just find a projection and where the projection is centered. And then we call coastlines and grid lines. And that plot puts these nice coastlines on the plot and these nice grid lines as well. And then, uh, but we still use the normal uh, X-ray plot thing. So we, we use these ice, this is the ice concentration, I think, but with some coordinates that I've added. But um, anyway, take a time slice, slice longitude and latitude, and we just plot, um, and reuse the axis so that it plots on this nice um, thing. And we have to specify this transform bit so that it transforms it correctly. So it tells what sort of transform it's currently on so that it can put it onto this orthographic one. But you can see you produce uh, really pretty plots. Um, and I assume that's what people have been doing before. Uh, and the reason I did this notebook was just to show that you couldn't do the same thing in the Northern hemisphere. If you just, you can do latitude and longitude, the simple one that's wrong basically. But then when you try and um, plot it uh, with, with Carter Pi, you get all this missing stuff because it, it's, it's not using the correct coordinates. Um, and you're slicing with, um, again, not using the correct coordinates. So you actually, it's a bit hard to tell, but you get curves and things, it looks a bit weird. Um, and this was just an example of going through and, and again, using the wrong selection, but doing a plotting it correctly with these two dimensional coordinates I was saying before. So it plots correctly, but the selection is, is weird. And so to do it properly, you have to use one of these where there's where selections I said before, drop the coordinates, uh, and then, and then plot it specify the X and Y coordinates and plot it correct. And then it all plots correctly in the tripole. So it's just a lot, it's a lot more complicated. Um, but that's on the Cosima cookbook, uh, Re Cosima recipes uh, website, if you want to have a look, um, to walk through some of those, how some of that stuff's done. So uh, I will unshare. <laughs>